Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Enter the Bible podcast, where you can get answers or at least reflections on everything you wanted to know about the Bible, but were afraid to ask. I'm Katie Langston. And I'm Katherine Schifferdecker. And we have as our special guest today, one of our colleagues here at Luther Seminary, Professor Jenny or Jennifer Wojciechowski, uh, almost as bad as Schifferdecker. Uh, <laughs> or maybe uh, at least as complicated. Uh, so Jenny, uh, Jenny is uh, an assistant professor of church history here at Luther Seminary and the author of uh, a book called Women and the Christian Story, A Global History, a recent book of hers. Uh, and she teaches, uh, well, she teaches a lot uh, here at Luther Seminary, but one of the classes she teaches is about women in, uh, in the church. So, uh, Thank you so much for being with us, Jenny. Thanks for agreeing to answer some uh, listener questions with us today. Well, thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here today. Well, so one of the questions that we've had uh, from a listener, um, and once again, we say this every time, but if you have a question that you would like us to address on the podcast, feel free to go to enterthebible.org and you can uh, you can submit your question there. We can't cover all the questions, but we do as many as we can. So the listener question that came in was this. Uh, the Apostles' Creed states, I believe, while the Nicene Creed states, we believe. Is there a significance, historical, theological, or otherwise, to this difference? Now, we've kind of uh, uh, expanded that question a bit um, to talk, uh, since this is Enter the Bible, we wanted to talk about uh, the, <laughs> the connection between Bible and creed. So we kind of generalized that question to this. How did we get from the, uh, from the Bible to the creeds? And here we're talking primarily about the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed, though we might mention the Athanasian Creed as well. Uh, so uh, these, these three uh, great creeds uh, of the church. So Jenny, we're going to throw it to you. Like, uh, maybe start with um, the more general question. Like, how did the creeds come about? How did we get from the New Test, Old and New Testament, the Bible, uh, the early church to uh, to these creeds? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and so I'm going to focus right now on the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed, um, and because they kind of have different starts. Um, they came about differently, um, but they're both really important for um, Christianity. So the Apostles' Creed um, comes from something called the Old Roman Creed. And the Old, Old Roman Creed um, comes out of um, like a, a baptism sort of formula. All right. Hmm. So in the early church, uh, the process of becoming Christian was three years long. All right. It was a three-year catechesis. And you were generally an adult when you became a Christian. And then when you actually get baptized, you're asked a series of questions, right? Do you believe in the Father? Do you believe in the Son? Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? And so this creed emerges out of this. All right. It's Trinitarian in, in structure, um, whereas the Nicene Creed actually emerges out of the first ecumenical council at Nicaea in response to the big heresy in the early church, Arianism. Dun, dun, um, dun. And so, yes, dun, dun, right. dun. Well, just, uh, just a couple <laughs> of um, uh, definitions. So yes, what is an ecumenical council and what is Arianism? for our listeners who might not know those things. Yes. All right. So in the early church, um, you know, because often my students will ask me this, you know, why don't we just use the Bible? Why don't we? So for the first 300 years, there is a lot of figuring things out, right? When you generally, when you read the Bible, do you come away with a really firm grasp of Trinitarian theology or the incarnation? Usually people have some, quite, yeah, we can debate that, right? But people were debating it, right? Right. And so this big, big debate is around the incarnation, the nature of Christ, all right? There was a priest named Arius, and oh, Arius Arius. started teaching. <laughs> he started teaching that there was a time when the sun was not, that Jesus was created. He was God's first and greatest creation, but that he was a creature, right? Mm. And, and I mean, he was, he was a great publicist. He set it to music. People were like walking around, singing jingles, like there was a time when the sun was not. And it really <laughs> took off. Yeah. 
All right. What what time period are you talking about here? Like, um, like kind of late two hundreds, early three hundreds. All right, okay. and it really comes to a head in like the three twenties. All right, and the church is all in a fight over the nature of Christ. Was God was Christ created or not? Meaning, and so is Christ God or not? Right? Isn't that sort yeah. of like what's at the heart of that? Like, yes, is the Son. Like uh, yeah. like us, maybe cooler and better, but or is the son a person, what later became understood to be a person of the, the Trinity, right? Right. Is Jesus okay. like a demigod? Is Jesus right. like kind of like God, but not really God? Is Jesus of a similar substance or the same substance of God? We get into all these questions around around substance and, and things. And, and part of it comes from kind of a platonic influence in Christianity of if God the Father is supposed to be unchanging and immovable, how does Jesus fit in there? And mm -hmm. so if you're really influenced by this Platonist idea of an unchanging God, then Jesus as a creature, as more of a demigod that can connect humanity with God the Father seems to make a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. All right. And this belief really takes off. Um, and so people start fighting and, you know, Christians like to write angry letters at each other. Um, they did that even back then, huh? <laughs> oh, oh, yes. We've got some scathing letters from the early church. Uh -oh, yes. Uh -oh. um, it's, it's, it's a time honored tradition. Um, and so thank the God emperor, they didn't have Twitter. <laughs> yeah. Or whatever we're calling it now. X. Yeah, keep going. X. Keep going. You mean X, Katie? <laughs> um, and so the emperor was able to call this ecumenical council, right? Mm -hmm. First one ever because Christianity had been illegal for the first 300 right. years and then it became legal. And so we could have these fights in the open now. We can really discuss this. And so he called bishops from all around the empire and they met at a town called Nicaea, which was like a resort town, not too far from Constantinople, which was the capital of the empire at that point. He had moved the capital from Rome to Constantinople. And I, I actually just want to take a moment to remark on how bizarre this would have been, all right? We had major persecutions, all right, about 20 years prior to this. And a lot of these people would have, like, been tortured, okay, mm. and by the state. And now they're getting an all-expense-paid vacation to a resort town <laughs> to, like, pound out some, like, issues of theology together. <laughs> Think about that. <laughs> And so all these bishops come to deal with the Aryan issue. There's other issues too, a dating of Easter and, and different things like that and yeah. how to remit lapsed Christians and things. But the big, big issue is Arianism. Hmm. And so, you know, you get everyone together and there's this impassioned group for Arianism that Jesus has created. There's this impassioned group that no, no, Jesus is God. Jesus was not created. And most people... We're like, we want to compromise. What changed? The Arian position, Arian actually was not, Arius was not allowed to talk because he was not a bishop. He was a priest. So he had somebody Shut else up, speak Arius. for him. Yeah, yeah. He couldn't even talk. Mm. And what changed was that the position was actually explained. And suddenly everyone sort of went wild. And at this council, you have like, it's like 300 bishops or something, right? Mm -hmm. We don't know the exact numbers, but something like that. And you have bishops yelling, heresy, you lie, blasphemy against Arius. And so most of them went from, we want to compromise to, we want to condemn this in a mm. very, very clear fashion. Uh, so like they didn't understand all the implications or what Arius was really saying? Before yes. Oh. They didn't really understand what he was saying. And once oh. they realized that he was saying that Jesus was a creature, mm -hmm. they were like, oh, no, 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 no. Because this fundamentally changes the faith, right? If Jesus isn't God, then, what, what does that mean for Christianity? It means, you know, I, mean, let's, I mean, let's actually ask that question, like right. not rhetorically, but like, yes, if Jesus isn't God, what does that mean for Christianity? Right. So the phrase, the Nicene phrase, the kind of the orthodox position is the incorruptible must become corruptible for the corruptible to become incorruptible. God has to become yeah. like us so we can become like God, so mm -hmm. we can be saved. And yeah. that's Athanasius, right? Mm hmm Yep. On the, the great defender of the, uh, the Nicene faith. Yes. 
That's a beautiful book, by the way. And it's it, it's relatively readable, especially if you get like a good translation. I remember reading it in seminary and being like, oh, this is very lovely. This is It's a very lovely book, I think. On the Say the name of the book again. On the Incarnation by Athanasius. Oh. I think everyone should read it. It's a very oh, beautiful yeah. book. It's little, a lot of, slender. Yeah. A lot of these early texts are not as intimidating as you might think they are. Yeah, they're I not. I mean, as, as long as you're reading them in translation. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I think this really gets to the heart of the question, though. Why why not just the Bible? Okay, why do we need, need a creed instead of the Bible? Because first, the bishops actually decided we're just going to use scripture to try to argue this. And it didn't work. And one of the reasons it didn't work is that both sides of the, the conflict were using scripture to, to argue their points. But different texts. They were kind of choosing... Using yeah, exactly. They're choosing different texts. Um, so they decided they were going to use a creed. And now creeds have been floating around at this point. All right. There's creeds in different places, often having to do with baptism and kind of initiation rites into the church. And so they decided to write a creed. And we have two versions of the Nicene Creed, the one that comes out in 325, and then another one that comes out uh, after the Council of Constantinople um, in 381, where we get a longer, more robust version of the creed. And that's the creed that we recite today. Um, but in it, so I've got, I've, got, I've got all the creeds in front of me. I've got the different versions of the creeds in Amazing. front of me. Um, but when you look at it, then uh, thinking about this controversy, thinking about Arianism, um, the words start to take on sort of a new meaning. Mm -hmm. You know, the the bit about God the Father, you know, makes sense. But then I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son, born mm -hmm. of the Father before all ages. Right? God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, right? Yeah. Consubstantial yeah, yeah. with the Father. Um, so it's kind of over and over again, you see, you know, no, Jesus is not created. Right. Um, and in the original creed, they actually have in the 325 version, um, there's a little bit at the end. And if you say Jesus was created, and if you say these things, you'll be anathemized by the church. Okay. Oh, well, it's intense. It's very explicit in the original version. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think that like, um, so I grew up in a tradition that's like non-credal and like kind of like looks looks down its nose like this. If you're on YouTube, I have my glasses down and I'm looking down my nose at the creeds. Um, it, because if you if you if you read them out of context, they they don't make much sense in our context. <laughs> and I remember taking early church history was one of my first classes that I took in seminary and I, and, 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 and learning about the Arian controversy and then reading the creed and being like, that's not nonsense. <laughs> that's just not like gobbledygook. That's actually saying a very important thing about a question that was in dispute at the time. And so I think it's it's very important to <laughs> to know the context, to know what the what the argument was about um, in order to see what's at stake and to realize, oh, that's not just like some dudes making it up. It, that's you know this is this is a process of discernment and interpretation that actually has very profound implications for our faith and I would connect that back to the scripture right like here it, they are wrestling a little bit with um platonic questions but correct me if I'm wrong um you know Jenny and Catherine but a big piece of this comes out of the scriptural witness of there being one God. Mm. and one mm. god that we worship. And so a few of the things that are at stake are like if if Christ is is a demigod or is a lesser god or something like that then to worship him is idolatry. Right. But they'd had these mm -hmm. centuries of deep deep prayer and experience of worship of Christ. So it's not just like an intellectual exercise, it's a spiritual discernment exercise that comes out of the practice of the church and does come out of the reading of scripture as well, that, that, that there's the one God, uh, there's the one God, and then, um, uh, and then also the question of how, if there is the one God, but we've discerned these experiences with the Son and with the Holy Spirit, which we haven't talked about as much because Arianism was mostly concerned with the, you know, with the question of who is the Son, um, 
but if we've had these experiences with the with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and as uh, how does that how does that work within a monotheistic framework, as well as sort of the Platonic questions that are floating around? By the way, just because a friend of mine once said Platonic, I thought that meant not romantic. Oh, <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Platonic in the academic sense is uh, having to do with Plato and Platonism. But anyway, right. just wanted to yes. that in case. Yes, thank you. Thought, what do you mean? They were them? not right, right. in a romantic relationship with the Lord, <laughs> although some some worship songs make you wonder. Some worship songs. Yeah. And I love the Mystics, and it it can get and a little spicy there too. It can. It can. <laughs> Anyway, all right. So that that's really helpful, both of you. I think, uh, yeah. So, so how do we get from the Bible to the creeds? Well, the creeds become a kind of lens through which to read scripture, or, or I don't know if that's the right analogy, but um, uh, uh, um, something to read alongside scripture to help interpret uh, scripture. And I think. A point you made, Katie, is important to emphasize again. This isn't like a top down. Uh, I, I'm thinking about books like The Da Vinci Code, right? Which mm-hmm. is not as popular mm-hmm. as it used to be, but you know, 20 years ago or yeah. whatever, right? It's not a big conspiracy, right? Right. No. <laughs> but the church is, you know, imposing the, the, the higher ups are imposing their view on the whole church. It, it comes from centuries of practice and of discernment and of prayer and of community worship. Is that fair to say, Jenny? Yes, yes. And I think that's a wonderful point you make because I often get a lot of questions being like, well, aren't the creeds exclusionary? You know, um, people have questions about that. And, and I want to point out, like, in the early church, people... <laughs> People, there was not a set canon yet, like, right. all right, there was not set doctrine yet. People wanted to know, like, what was correct? Like, how should we be worshiping God? How should we be viewing God? Um, who's, like, a trustworthy teacher? Who isn't a trustworthy teacher? And so people really, really wanted to know. And so this was giving guidance. Um, and the creeds are a, a wonderful teaching tool. They are, you know, I'm Catholic. And so we recite the Nicene Creed every single week and it just kind of is baked in you and it's, it's Trinitarian, right? It's the formulas, the three parts of, you know, what the father does, what the son does, what the Holy Spirit does. It's just in you. Um, and so I, I think it's not, you know, obviously on this side of history, I can see how people look at it that way. But at the time, it was very wanted and very needed to kind of set these boundaries of this is what the Christian faith is, because no, like, it wasn't there yet. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Right. Let's I mean, talk you had a to bit more. It. Sorry, what, Katie? I just said you had to interpret it, right? These yeah. experiences yeah, yeah, yeah. that you'd had, the writings, the things that are beginning, the, the, the scriptures that are becoming authoritative in that time, like, it's not like it came down on a silver platter. It's not yeah, like it ever comes right. down on a silver platter. Right. I guess the exception would be when it came down on written in stone, the Ten Commandments. <laughs> the Ten Commandments. <laughs> hey, let's talk about the Apostles' Creed. So you've you've mentioned that a bit, Jenny, but it, so it started as a kind of baptismal formula, right? Or yes. part of the baptism service. Yes, it did. Um, you know, the so what time of- period are we talking about with the Apostles' Creed? Okay, so the old Roman creed is really early, like 100s, 200s. Um, and then you get a pretty set version of the Apostles' Creed by 400. Um, and then the final version that we use now is more 700. Oh, um, okay. There's a few lines that got added later, like uh, the part about like Christ descending into hell. That, that's a, more of a late, you know, 7th, 8th century edition. Um, and what it's pretty similar to the Nicene Creed, though it's much shorter. Right. Um, and the other thing that is of note is it is not an ecumenical creed. All right. So the cool thing about the Nicene Creed, it sounds like I'm trying to sell the Nicene Creed, but <laughs> for ninety nine ninety nine, right? Right. So it's the best of the creed. No. Um, the the cool thing about the Nicene Creed is because it was done at an ecumenical council. The Catholic Church recognizes it. The Orthodox Church does. Um, so all the ancient churches recognize it. Obviously, Protestant churches do too, as inheritors of the Western tradition. Um, 
but the Apostles' Creed was always a Western creed. Mm. Oh, I didn't know, know that. That's interesting. Mm-hmm. Yep, it's a cool. it's a Latin creed. Oh, um, interesting. So the old Roman creed presumably came out of Rome. Um, and as I said, there was different creeds kind of floating around. There is a, a hilarious, there was this guy in the early church, Rufinius, um, and he was writing about the Apostles' Creed and taking from the Roman Creed. And he was like, well, the Roman Creed was shorter because fewer heresies popped up in Rome, um, <laughs> and, but, which is funny just in itself. Um, but then, but the other thing it tells you is why were people using creeds? To to battle against other teachings that they are trying, yeah. so they are using it as a teaching tool. Sure, right? right. Like this is what yeah. we believe. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and 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 part of it is like it's used in the in the sort of baptismal liturgy. Uh, maybe for those who aren't familiar with the more liturgical kind of tradition, you know, there's a there's part of the baptismal liturgy when when you're asked the candidate for baptism is asked, do you believe in God? And they respond by reciting the word of the along with the entire body that's assembled at the baptism uh, that's assembled at the baptism, I believe in God the Father Almighty creative creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus believe Christ? In I Jesus believe Christ. in yeah. Jesus Christ. Right. And you you recite the creed um mm-hmm. together. So that's cool to know that that even if even if the precise elements of the creed have changed a little bit over the years, that as for a very 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 long time, that's been a part of confessing the faith and and receiving baptism. Mm-hmm. I think that yeah. that brings up a really important uh, point too, Katie. That so I've had friends uh, who have said, "Well, you know, I'm not. I don't." we don't recite the creed at our church because I don't just, I don't believe everything in it. Right. Like, especially the virgin birth or, you know, things like that. Some of the harder parts. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I just think that's a real loss because this is one of the things along with scripture and uh, uh, you know, Holy communion and other things that connect us to this great cloud of witnesses through the centuries. Right. Like this is a creed that has been recited for hundreds, more than a thousand years, uh, you know, in the case of the Nicene Creed, uh, closer to 2000 years, right? This is something that connects us to believers across time uh, and across space. You know, not only does it connect us in time, but it connects us to believers even now in Asia and Africa and, you know, uh, South America, other places, right? That it's not just about you, right? right? It's not, mm-hmm. It's not just about you and your individual beliefs and your and your individual qualms about whatever, but it's it's about being a part of this great cloud of witnesses again uh, in time and space. Well, and one, one of the things I tell my parishioners when I, you know, because people will say to me, well, I have doubts about this. I have doubts about that. You know, it's like, well, yeah, welcome to faith. <laughs> we all have doubts about mm-hmm. lots of things all the time, you know, but um but the thing about saying the creed together and why it's beautiful, I think, to say it in community is like we can believe for each other. Right. So on a day when we're saying it together, on a day that you're having a hard time with an aspect of the creed, like for me, sometimes, you know, I doubt sometimes the church. I'm like, really? Like in the part where we talk about the Holy the Holy Catholic Church and I'm like, yeah. oh, my gosh, God, you're, you, you're relying on us human beings? Are you sure? <laughs> right? I'm just... Just to use an example, right? Like on the days that we doubt different aspects, the kind of the, the core tenets of the faith, we still come alongside and, and maybe someone else who just had a beautiful experience being helped by the church. They are really believing that part when I'm not believing it and we're saying it together and we can believe with each other and for each other um, and connecting us to each other, you know, across time and space, the body of believers across time and space. That's I do want to... I do want to talk. So again, coming out of a tradition that, you know, rejects the creeds and things like this, I've always been, I'm always very interested in defending. Which is the the Mormon. The the Mormon. Mormon, Yeah. The Mormon tradition. But, um, you know, one of the things that you do here is that the creeds uh, are not biblical. And I know we can't get into like a whole thing about it, but what, what I would say, and I would love to hear Jenny and Catherine, you know, maybe what your perspective would be is like, um, the the correct the entire Nicene Creed with all of the 
metaphysical implications <laughs> worked out, you know, or whatever. No, you won't find that in scripture. But what you do find is um, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit in scripture, right? You you do mm-hmm. find people worshiping God, uh, worshiping Jesus, worshiping the Holy Spirit, and, and worshiping the triune God and the power of the Spirit. Like, the, the 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 precise trinitarian you know definition or whatever that we get in the creeds isn't there but that's not to say that the concepts are not scriptural or biblical you think that's fair to say yeah for sure yeah 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 uh, you're right i think because, because scripture has many different voices, right, and many different facets. And and even things, you know, the closest thing we have probably to doctrinal literature in the Bible are the letters of Paul, right, mm-hmm. where he lays out um, somewhat like a systematic theologian, lays out, you know, uh, uh, various tenets of the faith. But even those are written to a specific church and a specific situation and so it's not like he's writing, um, you know, a three-volume work on Christian theology, including right. the creeds. But so you don't get a full kind of kind of creed uh, there. But but the creeds are based on scriptural passages, right? They don't come out of nowhere. So as you say, we have uh, we have Jesus praying to his Father, right? We have God the Father. We have. Uh, 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 mention of the Holy Spirit, for instance, at the end of John, when when Jesus is talking about sending, uh, you know, the Paraclete or the Comforter, right? We have uh, certainly, obviously, Jesus uh, speaking about "I am the Father, or one." Right. So the so it's based on Scripture, even if it's not laid out systematically as it is in the creeds. That kind of thing. Yeah. One. I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that, Jen. I that was a beautiful answer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, one 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 way of saying it that I've heard that I thought was a really nice way to put it is that is that you know it's it's through it's through the questions that arise right that we're able to hone our language and become more precise mm. about the things that we find in scripture and that and that the creeds are 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 ways of kind of um, kind of precise ways of speaking about those yeah. things that help you know, that yeah, help us sort of root way. ourselves in, in something sturdy. Right. Yeah. Precise and, and concise. Yeah. Right. You know, yeah. It's a, yeah, yeah. it's a few paragraphs of like, right? let's just sum up the Christian faith and a few right. paragraphs that we can, we can memorize. And yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. So two more questions and I, I'm afraid we'll probably have to be quick because uh, we try to limit ourselves to 30 minutes, but Back to that original question. Mm. Do you have any guesses about why the Apostles' Creed starts, I believe, and the Nicene Creed st- uh, states, we believe? So that's one question. The second okay. one, before I forget, we probably should say something about the Athanasian Creed as well. So I don't know how you want to, which one you want to talk about, Jenny. But. I'm not entirely sure about the I versus we. Um, I, I could have tried to see if I could look it up. My guess is just because of the the one coming out of the baptismal tradition and the other one being a collective oh, project that that, that's yeah. my guess um no, but i'm not 100% yeah mm-hmm. that um, makes a lot then, of sense yeah um and then the Athan- athanasian creed i read something really funny it was like creedal scholars can only agree on two things about the athanasian's creed athanasius did not write it and that it's not a creed um, <laughs> so Amazing. There we go. There we go. <laughs> right. So, okay. Ath- like, let's get the uh, Athanasius did not write it. He absolutely did not write it. Um, and, it was wait, written. Who is Athanasius? Athanasius was the he was the long suffering uh, defender of, of Trinitarian yeah. Nicene Orthodoxy. Um, he was exiled over and over again. Uh, the Bishop of Alexandria. Um, he was a deacon actually during um, the Council of Nicaea. Mm. Um, and so it very, very well respected early church father, um, but he didn't write it. Um, and we know that because it was written long after he had died and it was written in Latin, not in Greek. Um, <laughs> and so the Athanasian Creed actually probably came out of probably sixth century Gaul, which is now France. 
um, though we're not entirely sure who wrote it. Um, it was probably meant um, to like examine and educate clergy, which is why it's so much more intense probably than the other creeds. <laughs> And in it, so it's not a creed because it doesn't start with "I believe," right? Oh. Um, it's it's a list of like what is the Catholic faith, um, and and so the structure is very different. Um, and it's basically like if you want to be saved, these are the things that we believe as Catholics, and and this is this is the faith. And um, we so would I've say, also, as Lutherans, we would also claim the the phrase "Catholic" with the little c, understanding yes. that that's a Latin term that means universal. So we're not; Thank it's you, not Katie. just for Roman Catholics, but it's it's small c universal. So the word "Catholic" actually means universal. So we're saying the the for the universal Christian faith, this is a, a, a great teaching tool, especially for clergy. That's cool. Yes. What is Sorry. what's the status of the Athanasian not creed? Uh, not Athanasian. <laughs> the not Athanasian not creed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in the Eastern Church or in the Orthodox Church, does it have any standing there? Yeah. So it's kind of funny. Um, so the theology is pretty Western, um, but the Eastern Church was like, oh, well, if Athanasius wrote it. So there was like a time when they were dabbling with the creed, and then when it became firmly established, he didn't write it. They just rejected it entirely. <laughs> So no, the the Eastern Church does not use the Athanasian Creed at all, but the Catholic and then Protestant churches do. Okay, good, good, good. You are a storehouse of knowledge. Uh, Thank you so much, Jenny. You you've brought uh, a really good perspective and uh, answered our questions well. So and brought in some humor too. That's always good in in talking about church history. So well, this is thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Yeah, uh, yeah. So uh, uh, if you're interested uh, in more, we invite you to go to enterthebible.org and look. uh, We have other podcasts. We have uh, lots of essays and entries about uh, uh, the Bible and uh, related topics. Uh, So please uh, go there. uh, Like if you enjoyed this podcast, like and subscribe uh, and share it with a friend. Thank you for joining us today.